In this second video on the history of American language and communications, we'll look at the era from about the revolution through the late 19th century, the Industrial Revolution and Victorian ages. But starting with the revolution, I was talking about how the communications remain primitive, and you can certainly see the problems with communications during the revolution and the planning it often took uh, to coordinate a resistance. For example, uh, look at the famous ride of Paul Revere and William Dawes to warn the col colonials that the British Army was coming. They, they had to get that information there quick, and it took some effort. During the war, uh, Washington was constantly struggling to communicate securely and timely, at least, with his fellow commanders in the Continental Congress. The first United States government was hampered by an inability to communicate. The Articles of Confederation, that first government, provided for congressmen to serve one-year terms. These congressmen, however, felt the need to be in their district, if nothing else, in a campaign constantly, and there was often no necessary quorum in Congress. Many congressmen were left unaware of what Congress was doing. The problem of bad communications was part of the reason the Founding Fathers created an electoral college system, a better way to count votes and transmit electoral results. The inauguration was in March, four months after the election, to allow sufficient time for the problems of communication and travel. As the revolution was just beginning, the Second Continental Congress created the United States Postal Service, in part to help spread revolutionary sentiment and unite the colonies. When the war was over, the new Constitution mandated a federally funded and managed postal service, and the new Congress complied with 75 postal offices and 1,800 miles of postal routes. Its job, by law, was to maintain a regular schedule of picking up and delivering mail, as well as coordinating international mail delivery with foreign countries. Despite the new Postal Service, international news remained considerably delayed in the early national era. In fact, as Great Britain and the new United States tried to negotiate their differences leading up to the War of 1812, an agreement was actually reached in Europe, but the news hadn't arrived before Congress declared a war. In this sense, the war was unnecessary and a product of slow communications. In any event, with federal subsidies, the early United States Postal Service delivered newspapers up to 100 miles for a penny, and beyond that for a cent and a half. These pictures are indeed pictures, so they're a little bit later than the early national period. In the early national era, the number of newspapers exploded. In 1800, there were between 150 and 200. By 1810, there were 366, and by 1830, there are well over 500. Newspapers followed the Western growth of the nation during this period and were critical in binding the nation together. Most of these newspapers, especially out West, were poorly written and, and printed and were encouraged by political partisans as a way of spreading their political views. Every congressman would communicate with his district through the local newspaper, which of course also included local news. Only the large city newspapers began to hire correspondents whose job it was to report the news. Most newspapers were just passing along common knowledge and word of mouth. One of the major advances in newspapers during the antebellum age was the invention of the steam-powered rotary press. This expanded the number and quality of the established newspapers, but also led to the creation of the penny press. The penny press were small newspapers that sold for one cent and thus had a larger audience. They were largely separate from the political parties and, their, uh, and all the political parties' control, and they focused more on, like we might say today, tabloid content. During the antebellum age, the Postal Service continued to grow, and in 1847, introduced stamps for letters. Many of the cost of letters earlier had been borne by the person receiving the letter. Eight years after uh, stamps began in 1847, the Postal Service began registered mail, which offered people assurances that the letters had arrived. Nine years after that, during the Civil War, postal money orders began, which was a way to safely send money. And you can see the very first U.S. postal stamp here on the right. There were a lot of advances in communication during the antebellum era. One was the development of American Sign Language for the Deaf. It traced its roots back to Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet, who traveled to Paris where there was a school for the deaf teaching a sign language. He returned and set up a school in Massachusetts that taught a version of that language. These schools continued to grow and later uh, 
Gallaudet's sign language became officially codified as the American Sign Language. The greatest communications advance during the antebellum age was undoubtedly the telegraph. In one gigantic step, it changed everything. Uh, it changed the delivery time of messages uh, anywhere in the country from days or weeks to hours and even to minutes for urgent messages. Tapping on a switch to generate an electoral pattern of dots and dashes that represented letters in the alphabet Telegraph operators sent signals on a wire to other operators connected to that wire. And they listened to the signals and then used a simple speaker and wrote the message. Throughout the 1830s, inventors in Europe had been working on electromagnetic communication and had patented the first electric telegraph. It was an American, however, Samuel Morse, a well-regarded painter, who invented in 1844 the first single wire telegraph and a code to interpret the signals, thus making telegraphy practical. By the beginning of the Civil War, telegraph operators were in virtually every significant city east of the Rocky Mountains, and you can see uh, Mr. Morse here. Morse's code, of course, was soon named for him, the Morse Code, and you can see the letters and the dots and dashes that he uh, used. Telegraph wires had to extend throughout the country, however, which was, of course, a monumental task. The railroads, who benefited from the telegraph, helped out, constructing telegraph wires along their train routes. With the new telegraph, the Western Union Company was formed in the antebellum age and, just as the Civil War was breaking out, completed the first transcontinental telegraph. The telegraph profoundly impacted American culture. Newspapers could now print national news almost instantly. Newspapers began to coordinate with the telegraph and created the Associated Press, or AP, to better distribute national news. With the telegraph, stocks could be bought and sold across the country in real time, creating the first national stock market and dramatically impacting the finance industry and thus economic growth. The first stock market tickers appeared, and then you see one of them here on the bottom left. And of course, it was a telegraph that made the money order possible I'd mentioned earlier. And of course, railroads could use a telegraph to schedule trains and customers. Like I say, they benefited. The impact of the telegraphs is hard to overstate. It was not just technology that transformed American communication during the antebellum age. In 1848, the acquisition of Mexican lands after the American victory in the Mexican-American War brought thousands of Spanish speakers into the United States. The number of bilingual Americans exploded, Spanish a dominant second language for much of Western America. During the Civil War, the telegraph, like the railroad, was crucial strategically and advantaged the North since it had greater networks of both. Abraham Lincoln Chonier spent hours anxiously waiting at the War Department in Washington for dispatches from his commanders in the field. Still, however, in the field itself, armies mostly used couriers with written dispatches. In one notable 1862 instance, Confederate General Robert E. Lee sent written orders to a fellow commander with a courier. The courier's message was intercepted, which gave the Union Army a forewarning of Lee's strategy. This uh, Lee's lost order was part of the famous Battle of Antietam, as shown on the right. The Postal Service expanded throughout the West after the Civil War, and in 1896 established free rural delivery. A few years later, the Postal Service began Parcel Post, which was the delivery of more heavy packages. The Postal Service began delivering postcards in 1872. A card had a picture or something on the front and you could write on the side or the back. After the Civil War, the Postal Service was delivering mail not just to uh, the closest post office, but to the closest point on a public road. Post boxes began to spring up throughout America. After the Civil War, technology continued to make communications easier. One invention was a typewriter. A large complex form of the typewriter had been invented in Britain, but in 1867, an American, Christopher Latham Scholes, invented the first small practical typewriter. His second model allowed people to type faster than they wrote by pen and contained many of the features of keyboards today, and you can see it here on the bottom. The first typewriters were placed on the market in 1874 and became known as the Remington typewriters.
Another invention that facilitated communications was the first phonograph, invented in 1877 by Thomas Edison at his Menlo Park, New Jersey lab. At first, Edison wrapped a foil around a cylinder. A handle turned the cylinder, which contained a needle that vibrated when Edison spoke, leaving a groove on the foil. Another needle could subsequently trace the grooves and replicate the sound. Edison quickly improved his phonograph using a vinyl disc, which was not so readily destroyed upon re re replaying. By the Victorian age, the first transatlantic telegraph cable had been laid between Great Britain and the United States. With other cables extended throughout the world, instant communication globally was now impossible, which is huge. The, no longer did it take international news, you know, days or weeks to arrive uh, by steamship. By the late 19th century, experiments were underway on what was then known as wireless telegraphy, which is today you might think of as the first radio. At first, all that could be transmitted by radio waves were dots and dashes, like the Morse code. This was still important for ships in the ocean who could report their location in signal distress, the famous, for example, SOS call. The most famous uh, SOS call, of course, was the Titanic in 1912, and after that, the government began to regulate uh, wireless telegraphy, and they mandated that ships had, the biggest ships had to have the t uh, most up-to-date telegraphy. And uh, they required a license to, to broadcast the radio. And uh, they also began to uh, identify individual licenses of broadcast by call letters. And they would assign these uh, broadcasters with their new call letters frequencies. Of course, probably one of the most significant technological advances in communications was the invention by Alexander Graham Bell of the telephone in 1876. Actually, Bell perfected and patented the telephone, while much of the earlier work had been done by other inventors in Europe. The first telephone really was not practical until the spread of telephone exchanges by the end of the uh, 19th century. Early versions of telephone exchanges were switchboards containing a place to plug in a jack for each phone in the exchange. When a call came in, an operator connected the caller's jack to a port of the party being called and notified them with a bell. The new exchanges created a new vocation for women, telephone operators. Once workable telephone exchanges existed, the market exploded, and the telephone quickly became a key part of the American life. At the outset, however, people hadn't immediately recognized the benefit of the switchboard exchanges. Bell created the Bell Telephone Company, which at first leased telephones in pairs, and then the individual customer had to arrange construction of a line between the two phones he'd purchased. Western Union Telegraph Company moved into the new business, but Bell then recognized the benefits of exchanges and switchboards. Then growing quickly, Bell soon had a subsidiary, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, or as it's known today, AT&T. This concludes the uh, second video on the improvement in language and communications from the uh, early national era through the end of the 19th century.